more seat up here for Judd Laramore when he gets here, who's the, the ACC member. And good morning. All right. Good morning. She's able to sit in this official chair. I know. it's nice. Yeah, it's She's very nice. official. So as you know, our first couple meetings were in a much less formal setting. So it'll take us a while to get used to this. But um, good morning. I am Stacy Schaefer. I am the chair of the Police Accountability Board for anyone who doesn't already know that. And as it is now 10 o'clock, I'm going to officially call the meeting to order. I'm not going to use that gavel because that just seems a little aggressive to me. But, um, but anyway, welcome. We have sort of, uh, we don't have a printed agenda. Good morning, Mr. Burke. Um, we don't have a printed agenda, but this morning I'm envisioning the meeting as being uh, less time consuming than our first meeting was by a long shot and really just an opportunity for all of us to kind of gather in the same room now that we've got a fully staffed ACC we've got a fully staffed police accountability and we've got our trial board member in place and so with that said um, I think I'd like to take a moment so that everyone from the law enforcement agencies has a chance to introduce themselves then we'll go around the room here and the dais and, and have Mr. Fry introduce himself, tell just a little bit about who you are, who you're from, what your organization connection is, and, um, and then I'll hear from the departments as to any updates that they have and we'll go from there, okay? So um, maybe if I could start with. Yeah, um, Sheriff Deweese, I'm the elected sheriff for the county. Um, with me is uh, Rich Hart, he's the under sheriff. And behind me is uh, Lieutenant Mark Devilbus. He's my uh, internal affairs investigator. He handles all the internal affairs investigations, not only for uh, the law enforcement side, but I also over oversee the jail. And so there are investigations that come in and out of the jail. The jail um, has a correctional officer's bill of rights. So Mark understands the process for that side of it. And then he's been knee deep in the new process so that, that uh, he could learn um, how, how all that's going to go and it's been pretty interesting. So I have an organization that's about 140 patrol deputies and right around 100 uh, correctional deputies. Um, so I don't, I don't need, know how much deeper you want to go, Stacey, yeah, but... Yeah, uh, really just kind of a basic yeah. intro. And then whenever yeah. you get to the updates, we'll yeah, go right. through that. Yeah, right. Perfect. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Ledwell. I'm the Chief of Police for the Westminster City Police Department. Uh, we have, we're authorized uh, 45 uh, sworn positions and we have 13 civilian positions. Uh, we have several of our members assigned to um, regional task forces. We have one detective assigned to the Child Advocacy Center. We have two detectives assigned to the County Drug and Firearms Trafficking Task Force. Um, that's really all. Okay, thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Major Robert Mitchell. I'm the Acting Chief of Police in the City of Monytown. We have 15 active people with the fully staff right now. We have 13 at the moment with two civilian employees. That's about it. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Chief Michael Spaulding, the Chief of the Sykes Hill Police Department. Uh, we currently have, oh, thank you. We're authorized for 10 sworn. Uh, we currently have nine, and we're working hard to try to fill that, that last vacancy as the other chiefs are. Um, that's about it. Okay. Morning, everyone. I'm Dave Snyder. I'm the chief of Hampstead. Uh, we do it with 10 people, myself included, and one civilian administrator. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Doug Reitz. I'm the chief of the Mount Area Police Department. I currently have uh, nine officers, counting myself. Uh, we're slated or authorized for 11, looking at a 12th this coming year. Uh, and of course, I'm the only town that's in the state that's. Uh, by county, so right. I'm also part of Frederick County as well. I'm John Hess, I'm the Chief of Manchester. We have seven, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll start, we'll start around this way. Hopefully we'll get, by the time we get to Judd, he'll be here, so. <clears throat> I'm Ian Shaw from town of Sykesville. And just so you know, this half is police accountability and this is ACC. Good morning, I'm Jeremy Willett with Child Fund International and Willett Family Farm. Good morning everyone, I'm Steve Miller. Uh, I spent 44 years in local government, just retired as town administrator of the town of Manchester. And uh, <clears throat> I look at this job as a challenge and uh, give me a retirement, uh, retirement job. 
But are you actually retired? I am. Okay. I am. Quasi. He's am. quasi. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Knight. I'm just a private citizen here. I've lived in the county for 25 years. I manage um, an importing and spice and flavor distribution facility here at Westmin in Westminster. I don't have any um, personal connect uh, history of uh, law enforcement, but I do have family connections. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Stacey Schaefer. I'm the chair of the Police Accountability Board and a member of the ACC by virtue of that fact. Um, I'm a lawyer, so don't hold that against me, as you all know. Um, but uh, I'm just glad to be part of this group. I think it's going to be a good working crew of lots of folks involved and, um, and good intentions. So thanks. Thanks for being here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tambra Smith Powell. I was born and raised in Carroll County. I worked, I'm a paralegal by profession. I worked at a law firm in Washington, D.C. for many years, um, retired from there, but became bored, and now I'm working part time for a law firm here in Westminster. I was married to a Maryland State Trooper for, uh, he's retired now. And uh, I feel that my experience here in Carroll and my experiences with my husband as a police officer and my training as a paralegal uh, give me a good background and experience um, to fully participate in this process. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Dean Horvath. I'm a 29-year resident of Carroll County. Um, I arrived here in 19... Um, 87 when the Navy sent me here on orders and I haven't left yet um, <laughs> I have left the Navy um, and um, since then I've spent 20 more years working as a federal um, civil servant including six years as an investigator at NSA's Office of the Investigator General so I have some investigative background um, and, and that included um, activities involving um, NSA's sworn police officers so um, not new to the challenges of law enforcement. Um, grew up as the son of a law enforcement officer. So I'm familiar with the, um, the personal stressors um, that come with that as well. And it's nice to meet everyone this morning. Yes, I'm, I'm Thomas Baird. I'm retired. Um, I spent 30 years with the city of Westminster in various senior positions. I was a citizen soldier. Concurrent with that, I spent 37 years in the Maryland National Guard, um, starting out as a helicopter mechanic, finishing up as a Command Sergeant Major, Senior Enlisted Leader for Maryland. And uh, I work with police during my career in various thin code enforcement and other activities. So I'm very happy to be here and hopefully I can lend some common sense to the process and make it work well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to fill in for Judd, who's probably upstairs We all now. know Judd. You all yeah, know Judd. Pretty well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what you might not know about Judd, though, is his connection with law enforcement. Um, he grew up in a family where law enforcement, that's what, that's what you did. And um, so I like that because he's got a nice balanced perspective, I think, and um, the ability to see both sides, which is part of what our challenge is. Anyway, and behind you, so Mike, there's a, um, there's a mic there, if you'll. I'm pretty loud. All right, good mm -hmm. enough. Uh, well, thank so you. introduce uh, yourself. I'm Mike Fry. I, I, I live in Carroll County way out in Taylorsville, about as far as you can, about a half a mile from Frederick. Uh, I uh, moved there in July. I lived in Gettysburg for seven years before that, but then uh, 13 years I lived, I lived in Sykesville, so I'm very familiar with uh, Carroll County. Uh, I'm currently working for the city of Frederick as an assistant city attorney. Mm -hmm. And of course, part of my job there is to represent the police department. Uh, and uh, I'm actually gonna prosecute a trial board here next month. Uh, but uh, my, my background, I, I've been in law enforcement since I was 21 years old. Uh, I was in the Army and MP. I spent uh, 11 years with Baltimore City, with, uh, where uh, Chief Hess is from. I, I was a sergeant there. Part of my duties, I got started there prosecuting trial boards mm -hmm. as a sergeant, which didn't make me very popular, as you can imagine. Went to law school at night, uh, represented the, uh, the city then for, for a number of years. Went to Baltimore County, uh, I, I did trial boards and represented, uh, I, I did civil litigation in Baltimore County, but I also did a lot of the trial boards there. <clears throat> uh, left there, went to Montgomery, I'm sorry, went to the Attorney General's office, represented all the sheriffs in the state. Didn't have to do a lot of trial boards, thankfully, but I did a lot of litigation, uh, civil rights litigation, uh, employment law, things like that. 
uh, went to Montgomery County, where I was the uh, principal counsel for the police department there. I was there during the sniper uh, the whole years, worked for Chief Moose, and did all the trial boards there. I prosecuted the trial boards there. Uh, went back to Baltimore City in 2004 as the chief of the legal division there. And uh, during these years, I was training uh, police chiefs, police uh, sheriffs, uh, trial board members, internal affairs members, how to do tri trial boards. I wrote a manual, it's, I, I think it's still used a lot of places uh, for hearing board members. Uh, and uh, I say, uh, I, after Baltimore City, I, I really had enough of lawyers. I had done litigation <laughs> for about 20 years, and I just had enough. So I went to work for the Department of Commerce down in Silver Spring, okay. NOAA, you know, mm -hmm. National Oceanic. Right. And I was a special agent there. So I was back, I was a gun carrying a special agent. I retired there uh, in 2019. Um, and uh, I sat around for three years, did all the uh, things I had to do around the house, and got bored. And uh, yeah, the city of Frederick was, you know, they decided mm -hmm. to hire me. So there you uh, go. That, that's that's my career Great. in about three minutes here. So. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Oh, and, and I guess I've been appointed as the civilian. You trainer. have been. Yes. Indeed, you have been. You're on the hook now. <laughs> um, so, Judd, I gave I gave a very quick 30 second Judson K. Laramore Sarah. Um, Thank you. Summary. I'm sure you did better than I did. <laughs> but if you would like to add anything, feel free. I, I'm fine. You're good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank every, I thank you all for sharing a little bit of background so at least you can put names to faces and all that good stuff. And hiding behind you, um, uh, this is Tim Burke, who is our county attorney, and Bethany Henderson from his office. And Tim, fill us in on, on what you're what your role is here. Well, after listening to Mr. Fry, I'm just going to say whatever he tells me right, to do. Right, exactly. <laughs> His experience. Uh, going to him. My name is Tim Burke. I'm the county attorney. Uh, we have been working trying to get this thing set up, and I look forward to working with all of you as we try and figure this out as we go along, basically. Uh, and uh, if any of you know of any retired judges in your, uh, in, in your, your your travels. Your social scene. We are in desperate need of a retired judge, and they have to be completely retired, just right. not working at all. We need somebody for the uh, trial board, so keep that in, in your head. But I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Do they have to live in the state of Maryland? Just in the, yeah, in Maryland. It doesn't have to be Carroll County. They have to live in Maryland, yes. They have to live in Maryland, not Carroll County. Right. right. Okay. Well, thank you all for the summary. Okay, now what I would like to do is turn to the law enforcement agencies to give us, you gave us great information at that first meeting and I really appreciate it. Um, I feel like we got a good uh, chunk of stuff to kind of navigate going forward. So if you could just kind of bring us up to speed as to any changes that you've observed anything that comes to your minds as something that we need to know about or should be concerned about or should be on our radar so that we can then learn more about it and, and help you navigate whatever that issue is. So um, maybe I'll start down at this end since I started down at that end before. Honestly, so. we have nothing to add from okay. Manchester. Okay. Our newest focus has been, as uh, Sheriff DeWeese knows, is the uh, Brady Giglio policy out of the state's attorney's office, but that's about it. Okay, all right. They're coming up with a policy for uh, basically any issues that were come up surrounding veracity with any one of our men and women. Okay. So, Ms. Schaefer, previously what, what other jurisdictions are used to, specifically where Chief Hess comes from in Baltimore, mm -hmm. Colonel Hart comes from Prince George's County, they would create a, a Brady list, per se. Okay. Um, and it would be a list of officers that they felt had veracity or integrity issues gotcha. okay. um, locally the state's attorney here through the association that he's a part of mm -hmm. um, Charlie Smith the state's attorney over in Frederick County they decided they would put a policy together as opposed to just having a an arbitrary list that right. they believed that was a, a, a group of officers that have veracity issues um, would work on a policy that would go back and forth between my office state's attorney and the local chiefs so that would identify issues or there was consistency right. mm -hmm. but you just didn't randomly there are people that are on Brady list that have no idea why they're on a Brady right. list okay. um, and and you could Google this and see the Baltimore Sun and the Washington Post have um, asked for those lists and they've been 
Uh, the attorneys, the state's attorneys in those areas have tried to stop from producing those lists, but mm -hmm. judges have, have ordered them to give those lists out. But there was simply no way to understand why you were on it or how to even get off of it if there was an issue. Um, so this process, as we get through it, we're close to being done a final product, okay. would be an agreement between each individual uh, jurisdiction and my office uh, with the state attorney's office to, to investigate appropriately and then have some sort of um, resolution when it comes to uh, integrity issues. We all agree that if someone has an integrity issue that they're they're not going to survive and, and be, on, be in right. our organizations. But um, there are issues periodically that come up that would put the question of the individual's veracity out there if properly investigated and agreed upon by both organizations that there isn't a veracity issue that they mm -hmm. would then become, they would come off of the list or they would, right. they would get their veracity back according to the courts. So are you working, is it like an MOU kind of? It would be an MOU between each individual jurisdiction, gotcha. and including my office, with the state's attorney's office. Okay. When you get that, when that's in a finalized mm -hmm. form and everybody's got it, can you shoot a copy of that? Yeah, I will. To, and I think the unique yeah. thing about that is that even if, let's say I disagree, my mm -hmm. investigation shows that, that there was not an integrity issue, but they believe that there is an issue at hand. There is, um, the, uh, the state's attorney would be they. Okay. So we're at some sort of impasse. Um, we will approach the judges, the circuit court judges, and ask them to look at the individual and then make a determination whether it is something that they will hear their testimony on. Right. Um, so we have yet to go before the judges, but it will, we're scheduling a meeting with the four judges so that we can explain the policy to them. Um, Sounds promising. I don't, we don't know what other way to go right. other than creating a list and then all of a sudden you're on a list forever and we don't right. know, right. like I said, you don't even know why you're on it. Um, but it could be something, and I think just looking around the room, Judd would have the ma majority of the mm -hmm. insight on this. It could, right. be, it could be something that could have been driven out of the state's attorney's office that they saw and said, well, this is suspicious, sent it over to me to investigate. I look at, and we go back and forth, and we are in agreement that it's either a misunderstanding mm -hmm. or there was more information that was needed in order to make that. Most of it, if not all of it, will be driven by the individual office itself, the law enforcement office, saying we saw this, mm -hmm. we got this complaint, and it is a veracity issue. We will notify the state's attorney. They will send us a letter saying that you, you notified us of this. We will fully investigate, um, let them know what our findings are, aside from what goes on with right. PAB and ACC right. so that we can make a determination whether that deputy officer or trooper can continue to um, be an active witness mm -hmm. uh, with the courts. Okay, great, thanks. So would thanks. that policy be drafted by the sheriff department? It's actually drafted by the state's attorney, but, but um, yeah. we've all had an opportunity to look at the policy and make amendments mm -hmm. to it and suggestions, and it's kind of a document that's gone back and forth and, and will eventually um, be produced for, for everybody. We've all had an opportunity to look at it and make our suggestions. It's in it's in its final stages now. Okay. So you look like you have a lot of questions on that, Judd. I, I just, it's just landmines everywhere. <laughs> there is. For, for, from my perspective, I mean, you know, as a, you know, if, as a public defender, if, if I knew this document was out there, I mean, you know, you'd be getting a discovery request in every case. We're getting that already. I mean, <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, honestly, no, we are. Just, we, we, get, just, we get that already. I just can't believe that that's being formalized. Um, that's already been formalized in Frederick County, and I believe okay. Charlie Smith's been using it over there for a couple of years now. And that it, was the it's training. Not bad, it's not a bad thing. I just, you know, it, it, I do think that the due process uh, needs to be kind of gone through if it's going mm -hmm. to be out there and, and formalized and you have a list. I mean, in this county, once an officer's name gets on that list, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, his role in the courtroom is pretty much over. Well, this is, this is not a list. This is no longer a list. I can go on a sidebar with you and, lo and let you look I, at I that, Judd. And, and discussion in, in front of it. it doesn't involve what I'm doing here. So the purpose of it was to do away with the list, right? It was to keep you from being on a list and literally just dying there forever. And, mm -hmm. and you're right. If you're put on a list, you're done, yeah. but th but there are people on a list that have no besides have not not no idea why they're on a list. There was no due process for them um, within the police department, so that 
we could explain to the state's attorney, here's what we learned from that mm -hmm. allegation that you made that so never was processed. The state just putting people on the list. Of, oh, my gosh. Two, call this type thing two three hundred in Baltimore so City. What, what happened was I could go all the way back to Pat Jessamy when she was a state's attorney in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. She had the list. She had this what they called the blacklist. Officers, detectives were on the list. They had no idea they were on the list. Mike Fries probably can attest to the fact that there was even times when Eternal Affairs had no idea they were on the list. Greg Bernstein came in the office, although he didn't have an MOU, he created a better a better list. Mm -hmm. There was a there was actually a working list between him and the police commissioner, and there was there was the officer had a chance to get off the list. Unfortunately, as we all know, and it's no secret, when Mosby came in the office, she threw gasoline on it, it exploded. There was 350 men and women on the list, and probably maybe about 100 of them deserved to be on the list. And as the sheriff was saying, they were coming out of the state's attorney's office. It could be a friend of a friend. They mm -hmm. just had a little question, and it just exploded from there. So I think what okay. our state's attorney is trying to do is narrow that right. process down so we can have a, a little bit better of a working list. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, I could probably speak for everybody at this table, if we have an officer that has those types of issues, you're, gonna be, you're not going to have to worry about a list. You're They're not going to be in the county That's anymore, been as a law enforcement. <laughs> exactly but right, there's, sir. But there are things, Judd, that I can, I'll, I'll, I would love to talk to you a little bit more about I'll, I'll it, but you. there are things that are, that are really, really gray that, that would never even mm -hmm. be anything that would be on a list yeah, and, and all processed all through. All my spider senses are tingling when you're talking about this. It's <laughs> like, we can't do this here. Mr. Baird had a question. Yes, sir. I just had a question of the sheriff. Is this envision in your mind like a case by case thing or kind of a blanket thing for a, an officer that might have a veracity problem? Um, so it would have to be case by case only because as an, as an individual allegation would come in, then there would be communication with, with the state's attorney's office on, on that particular allegation. And it could, it could literally be that um, we, we, a, a deputy was arrested for stealing at the local Walmart. And, and that hasn't happened, but let's say that we've seen stories like that. Well, obviously that their criminal conduct would lend credi credibility to their lack of veracity. Mm -hmm. So we would let the state's attorney's office know. They would mail us back and say, yes, we got it. We are not using that individual as a, a witness until you let us know what, what took place in that specific allegation. And, and in most cases, if it's a serious veracity incident like that, the notification at the end of it is going to be, we fired the deputy. Mm -hmm. um, but there are cases few and far between that have an explanation for it, that we could lend, that we could go back and say, here's the investigation. Now what's your thoughts? Is it someone that you would continue to use as a witness? I think it's more of codifying due process so that we don't have mm -hmm. gray areas or fogginess. Like, as a chief, when is my obligation right. to make notification to the state's attorney's office? Mm -hmm. And it's not a guessing game. There's a process in place that we follow. And then there's a process for once it gets adjudicated and the officer's cleared to take the steps needed mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for the information. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go down the line now. Bring us up to speed as to what's happening in Mount Airy. Mount Airy, like I said, is a unique place. <laughs> uh, being the only county or only town in the entire state that has bi-county jurisdiction, I think we kind of we kind of slip through the cracks to a certain degree because technically I'm a member of the statewide administrative charging committee. Right. Uh, they have oversight of my department and there is no police accountability board on the mm -hmm. statewide level. Uh, with that said, there's additional movement and legislation now to create uh, police accountability boards at the municipal level. Um, okay. I don't know where that's going to go. So I think this is something that's going to be changing for mm -hmm. quite some time. Um, and as I said, being in Frederick and Carroll County, I also participate uh, with the Frederick County Police Accountability Board and the Frederick County Administrative Charging Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's advantageous for me to have a relationship with, with both you and right. Frederick County because right. we don't know yeah. where I'm going to end up at this point. So I very well may end up back in Carroll and Frederick County or part of a municipality that has the accountability uh, board and a, ch a charging committee. So um, 
I think uh, with that said, I mean, there's there's still lots of changes and still things that's going to unfold for us. And uh, but I, it, it's advantageous for us to maintain a relationship with one another right. be, so because too. you probably will be getting complaints, you know, or possibly with with people that's part of my department as well, right. because there's no place really for them to go other than the police department. <clears throat> right. and it would just make sense that they would reach out to mm -hmm. you or Frederick County. Right. Indeed. Thank you, Tim. Tim is curious if each, uh, if each municipality got to have their own PAB and, and charging committee, would you have to do your own trial boards as well? And are you going to have to find retired judges? <laughs> I mean, oh each one. Okay, this is nuts. Yeah, it's I, it's hard to imagine. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is hard to imagine. Yep. So just one question. For, mm -hmm. So we missed you at the initial uh, introduction of the chiefs right so i was wondering can you give us a little bit of background on the department like how many officers the certainly 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 uh currently we are slated for 11 officers we're authorized strength of 11 counting myself uh this this uh budgetary season we're planning on adding another additional officer bringing us up to 12. Uh, we currently have nine counting myself um, and then we also have uh, one civilian employee at this time we're 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 authorized two civilian employees um, and again, we, we're a 4.1 square mile uh, patch of, of ground that kind of is in a sea of cornfields between Frederick and Carroll County. So, um, yeah, so again, we're the only bi county law enforcement agency that's on a municipal level. Yeah, the only other agency that probably worse than mine would be Del Mar, which is in two states. So, I kind of <laughs> hate to imagine what it's like for them. So, but. Uh, you know, we're, we're a work in progress with this. I think, like I said, legislation is going to change, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it wasn't legislation's intent to kind of lump me in with uh, agencies like the state police or the university system of the state of Maryland uh, with much bigger agencies and uh, that are part of the state government. I, I think we kind of slipped through the cracks and ended up someplace where, because I, I believe this is truly... Uh, vested in community policing and, and having your community decide, uh, make certain decisions for your police departments. And with the way it is right now, it, you, we kind of get away with that with a town like Mount Airy. And are you also in the youngest department, right? We mm -hmm. also are the youngest department. Mm -hmm. in How many years? Six. We've been, years. been around okay. for six years now. Before that, the, we, uh, Mount Airy was, uh, had contract with the state of Maryland, was right. part of the resident, resident trooper troopers. program. Okay. Correct. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know that we have much uh, new things to add since okay. the last time that we okay. met. Um, however, just some comments, and I'm going to try to to keep them brief, um, with the theme of being brief today, because right. I can have a tendency to ramble. <laughs> Uh, just some random things. That, Tim, you mentioned about uh, town boards. Um, I think that it, it does bring up some problems, but at the same time, I see it as a, a method to, to bring the accountability and the interaction down, down as close them. as possible mm -hmm. to, the, to the town level. Much as I love you guys, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I get that, but there's also some, you know, practical challenges that right. I think sure. are, are difficult. Um, just seeing town operations many times, it's difficult to get anybody that wants to volunteer for right. any of the things that are necessary around the right. town. Agreed. Um, Steve, you, you ran a small town, so how difficult mm -hmm. is it to, to get somebody for the zoning appeals, for the zoning, for the tree commission, for the election commission? Very, very difficult. Uh, the very ethics very commission. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of challenges out there. I don't think people really have an appreciation for how much goes into making a community run. And, and you know, mm -hmm. thank you for everybody here for, for what you're doing in, in this phase here. Uh, with reference to, there's been some comments relative to the uh, MOU that's being proposed with the state's attorney's office. We are very early in the review of that process mm -hmm. in Homestead. Uh, I can tell you, um, and I'm doing this in all fairness with the prompting of, of Chief Hess, uh, internally in the small agencies, we have the ability to, to basically do quality control and pay attention to what our people are doing on a regular basis. We do that in Hampstead. Uh, I can tell you just a, a brief story um, without any names. But to put it in context, uh, we had an integrity problem that we discovered during one of these routine quality assurance mm -hmm. reviews. That person was no longer in law enforcement by the end of the week. 
And we have the ability because of being small, one of the, the benefits, if there is one, uh, that you can move a little bit more rapidly than you could in a larger organization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, certainly Jim and Tom, they have a lot more that, it, that goes into it. Uh, but the point being that from our perspective, uh, and I, I think a lot of my colleagues here share it, Jim mentioned it a, a minute ago, we really don't have a space for somebody that has uh, some type of veracity right. challenge. Uh, in my mind, if you cannot testify in court, then that's an essential duty as a police officer. Mm -hmm. And I don't care whether you're the chief, well, I'm sorry, or you're the, the newest guy on the, uh, on the force. If you can't do that, th then you really can't perform the job anymore, and we gotta find somebody else to do it. Mm -hmm. so, but again, I'm gonna stay really yeah. very brief. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I wanted to comment on uh, the question regarding the municipalities. I, I sit on a board. It's the Maryland Municipal League Police Executive Association. Okay. We have a uh, legislative liaison on that board, and I called him this morning to get an update on that right. bill. Right, and so what's the... He said it doesn't look like that's going to pass the way it's written, okay. as is often the case. Uh, the, problem is, the problem is with mun uh, counties like PG County that have so many mm -hmm. municipalities, it would just be overwhelming. Right. So he didn't feel it was going to pass the way it was written, mm -hmm. and he thought it would maybe um, uh, allow a situation like we have where mm -hmm. uh, municipalities can sit on the, the county's board, not have to have their own. So I'll, I'll keep you up to date okay, on that as, great. as, as, Thank as you. developments are made. But in terms of the town of Sykesville, I just wanted to say a few things. Uh, we've done a good job of updating our policies with regard to all the police reform laws. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we're, we're up to speed on that. We've recently added the IA Pro, it, which is a complaint processing track, uh, complaint processing software that allows us to track things such as use of force, complaints, even departmental accidents, um, discharges of firearms. Mm -hmm. So that'll better enable us to be able to uh, report uh, on an annual basis. There's few few times where we have an incident like that, quite honestly. But that's that's good software to have, and I know many of the other municipalities are in the process of trying to acquire that as well. And then lastly, uh, we've, we've recently uh, signed a contract to purchase six more body-worn cameras, okay. which will give us a total of 10, which will allow for each of our officers to mm -hmm. have a body-worn camera on at all times. So I think we're in pretty good shape. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good morning, folks. Good morning. It's nice to see everybody this morning. Yeah. Um, as, the other, as the other chiefs have said, not much going on right now, I'm sure in the future. We'll all get to know one another much, much better. I hope not, but that. <laughs> um, it's not much going on in Tawny Town right now. Uh, as the other chiefs, I concur with what they say in reference to integrity issues, veracity issues. We have those. We won't have them long. Mm -hmm. um, we just won't. I know we won't in Tawny Town. So that's about it. Okay. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And so, thank you for the for the bullet point sure. summary so that's um we also have ia pro and and we use that it's got the public portal ability to satisfy the requirement that somebody can follow along with their case status um, we also track use of force vehicle pursuits um, we do something that you'll see at bullet point two in there it's a combination of tracking arrest and release investigative detentions and any warrantless searches that we conduct it's something we don't have to do, but we put it into place as a quality control measure. Um, and that gets reviewed administratively all the way up through me. So as you can see, the five that we've got in the first quarter are examples of, of what would be considered one of those things. Um, the first one, uh, we caught a group of individuals uh, from PG County preparing to siphon cooking oil. I guess there's value to cooking oil. Wow. Um, it gets resold uh, after the restaurant um, um, contains it. So they were preparing to do that behind rock salt. Um, we ended up charging via application versus an on-site arrest. So uh, technically we did investigative detention, release them. Mm -hmm. So anytime we do that, we make sure we're doing it correctly. We'll track it and review it all the way through myself. Um, the second one was uh, considered what we call consider arrest and release. We had a severely intoxicated individual who we arrested for a domestic assault. Um, they won't take them at central booking if they're 
that intoxicated, they go to the hospital mm -hmm. where they get treated. So we ended up applying um, for the charges via an application versus an on-site. So we made the arrest, took him to central booking, they got refused, we took him to the hospital, they got treated, and then we applied for charges. So that's what we would call an arrest and release. Uh, the third one was an investigative detention. We had some juveniles that were trying out the heavy equipment at the construction site, at the WTTR uh, uh, construction site. So um, we just uh, released them to parents and then we charged via absentia. So we just did the referral to juvenile services mm -hmm. that way. And then the final two uh, were encounters. One was a vehicle sitting at Dutterer's Park. The officers walked up on it. They were smoking marijuana inside there. So we seized it due to the quantity we didn't proceed with any charges and so that was an exigent circumstance to search and then the, the final one was a similar but it was a plain view search so that's just something that we put into place to take a look at the way we're policing and make sure it's being done correctly I do a lot of monthly roll call training for the officers I taught at our police academy when I was with Frederick City so um, I do a lot of search and seizure we take a lot of the cases that come through the state's attorneys association or through legit um, that are uh, um, decided now at the Supreme Court of Maryland level mm -hmm. and then we we walk through it so we'll, we'll before I give them the end result of what the the courts have decided we'll go through the case mm -hmm. and then we'll have discussion as to okay do you think it's a good case and right. why and then I, I teach them a two-step process for deciding it uh, step one being what is my level of certainty the person's just committed a crime and the second is do I have a warrantless search exception and then we work through that process Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to get that second nature for decision making yeah. but that's just something that we track <clears throat> uh, the first one is a reportable use of force we had two during the first quarter um, they get categorized we have um, uh, like I'm sure everybody else a use of force notification form which is just a statistic gathering okay. uh, yeah. form that uh, gets up or goes up through the chain of command gets reviewed all the way up to myself mm -hmm. um, the first one, there was a taser discharge. So with a taser, or, um, uh, you can have a display, which you have your taser out of the holster, but you don't point it and you don't use it. Um, you can have what we call deployment, which is that you actually point it at somebody and give them commands, and then a discharge. <clears throat> a discharge can be one of two things. Uh, you can discharge it uh, in probe deployment, which shoots out the two um, long strings and they create muscular dysfunction hopefully so you can get the person into custody or you can do a, um, a touch uh, which is a pain compliance which is less desirable so in this case it was the discharge of probes um, and that was accompanied by a takedown and that was based on a domestic assault arrest we got there um, the, the male party was intoxicated uh, he had a handgun sitting on a table that he went for so that was the uh, circumstances of that one. Um, the gentleman was apologetic once we had him into custody. Um, the second use of force was what we call empty hand control. So that's any use of force where it's um, not including strikes or kicks or knee use, but anything where you go hands-on with somebody, there's no weapon involved, there's no taser involved. Um, and it's something more than just guiding somebody or handcuffing somebody. We don't do them every time you handcuff somebody. We don't do them anytime you have to guide somebody along but when it turns into a control hold or anything where there's a struggle of some type where you have empty hand uh, involvement we uh, do a use of force on that so that was for an emergency petition we had an adult son with a mental health disorder who when we arrived on scene was actually physically fighting with dad in the residence um, and we used a minor um, empty hand uh, use of force to uh, take that individual into custody and then we completed the emergency petition paperwork, took him to the hospital where he was treated. So that's the sum of our first quarter reportable okay. type of events. Um, I attended along with, I'm sure, other people in this room, uh, a three hour training at the police training commissions on February 14th. Some of the things that they suggested to us and, and things that pertain to both the PAB and the ACC that um, I think are important to at least bring up and maybe eventually discuss is coming up with like a standardized communications protocol mm -hmm. so that, you know, I know I've got a pending trial board um, and we're gonna have incidents that come up. The law requires us to make notifications and vice versa within certain mm -hmm. time frames. 
and they suggested that we come up with some type of official protocol so that we're all on the same page. Who do we contact? Right. What method do we make that contact? Um, if you guys get a complaint, you know, getting it to us within 72 hours, mm -hmm. things like that, um, maybe putting that into some type of standard operating procedure. Okay. Um, the second thing is we discuss, like, what is a complaint? So we get people that call in quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, in a larger agency. And, and typically, thankfully, the majority of it is either performance issue or something that may be decided in the courts. Like, I was doing 36, and, you know, and I got a ticket for, you know, 38. Well, that's not something that I can decide, and I don't think you guys can decide. I think that's what the judge is going to make a determination on. Um, the second thing I'll, I'll call a performance issue. So, and usually the officer needs to uh, get a follow-up correction through the supervisor to go out and take additional steps. So if I handle a, um, a complaint of some nature, and maybe I didn't um, uh, do one of my investigative follow-up steps within a certain period of time, you know, and then the citizen calls in and says, hey, mm -hmm. you know, the officer came to my house and, you know, and this was supposed to happen and it hasn't happened yet. So then the, we contact the supervisor, the supervisor talks to the officer, says, get back out there and make sure you do step B. So kind of parsing out the difference between performance and misconduct. Mm -hmm. And what the training commissions relayed to me was the devil's in the detail with policy. So like for our policy, we have, which I provided to you at the last meeting, a code of conduct, which covers a, a, a variety of things. But within that is, you know, if somebody is egregiously um, malfeasant in their performance, they would get charged, potentially face discipline. Um, we also have a performance evaluation process. So if I go out and I'm doing a, a substandard level of performance in my duties, I may get a citizen who calls in and you know, is not happy with my level of performance, and we handle that through our performance system. So, you know, my concern was, what is our duty as an agency when a citizen contacts us, which happens in my agency, probably not nearly as much at the smaller agencies, but it does happen in my agency from time to time, fairly <coughs> regularly, where somebody's not happy with the performance of an officer. And to me, the majority of those are performance issues and not misconduct issues. Mm -hmm. So I guess we need to come to some type of understanding because I want to do things correctly. Right. And, but just from a logistics and a workload standpoint, right. you know, the majority of those get handled with me calling the supervisor, apprising them of the issue, and the supervisor contacts the officer. The officer takes step B, C, D to go do their job correctly, and, and everything's fine. I would hate to see that turn into an internal investigation because mm -hmm. I think it puts a lot of stress on the officer where the, there's a formal process that's going through the ACC. So I guess coming to an understanding as to what the difference is between a performance issue and a misconduct issue. Mm -hmm. So I could change my policy um, to take all the performance language out of that. Uh, the problem would be is if there was an egregious malfeasance of performance, if that makes sense, versus right. the the minute, uh, you know, stuff that we're all sometimes guilty of. Um, I don't. I would rather not see our officers put under scrutiny of and the stress of an ACC process every time there's a performance issue. Right. So trying to figure out, you know, and have conversation Where does that with line the board. Fall? Correct. As and to what how is can we make it distinct enough to then give you some guidance to, to move forward with. Correct. Yeah. And so what I would, I, I would, I haven't asked for the board, I mean, you know, I provided you with our uh, mm -hmm. internal investigation policy. And within that policy, the way that I've parsed it out is I have what's called an inquiry and then I have what's called a complaint. And then the complaint can either be a type one, which involves a citizen, which makes it an ACC matter mm -hmm. or a type two, which is something that's a, uh, administrative violation that we discover there's no interaction between a citizen and our officer um, that we handle internally and then it goes up through the process um, but to look at what I have written in there for the difference of terminology um, 
when I had the discussion with the commissions, they said that the devil's in the detail in the way you write your policies. Mm -hmm. um, so the question for us would be, you know, do we take all mention of performance out of our misconduct, code of conduct policy, and then just have that handled as a performance matter? What happens if a citizen calls in a performance matter, is not happy with the resolution that we provide as an agency? So these are kind of things that I see as road bumps, especially for, I think, a larger agency mm -hmm. such as ours, that we do have those that come in from time to time. Um, what I fear is that if we go too far down the formal process for a performance matters, I'm short people as it is right now. Right. People are quitting to go to the larger agencies that are luring away with hiring bonuses and other types of things. We're almost to kind of a critical level right now. If we put more scrutiny, I fear more people are going to mm -hmm. look for jobs elsewhere. Um, and I don't think that's in the best interest of it. Have anybody. you just um, as a have you noticed or had citizens reach out to you with what you would describe as a performance based kind of concern that then have an anticipation that it's going to go to either the ACC or to have some other? Fortunately, we have not had okay. any since since the curious beginning if anybody of said, the ACC. Wait a minute, I thought this was going to, you know, generate I think the something. one case that we sent you, Stacey, <coughs> would be the example of that. Okay, all right. And that guy constantly complains. And, right. right. And he, he believes that you and the board are going to do something different with it. Right. When in theory, um, it's a policy issue right. that we've dealt with and, and explained to him. He believes that you yes. are above what we're doing and you're going to mm -hmm. come down with a heavy fist and say no. Right. Uh, do this. So, so there are times when yeah. people believe that. Yes. Yeah. So, Mr. Pryor, do you have any thoughts on that based upon your record experience? Uh, certainly, as far as Frederick goes. Um, well, I can tell you. The, 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 the whole we, we're, we're talking about seriously in Frederick, the whole issue of performance versus misconduct, and I, I also got the information from the training commission about the devil in the details. So, <laughs> I, were you work with Frederick? I time? retired from Frederick City. Okay. Yep. Yeah, their, their policies are, they need a little adjusting right now, I think. But, uh, but we would need to stay consistent within all police departments right. so that you're seeing something that right. looks the same for all of us when it mm -hmm. comes to performance and, and actual misconduct. Agreed. And so I think what Tom's doing is, putting to you saying what do we what do you right. what do we what do, do we based on do? what the law allows us to do right. and what training we got from the commission yeah well i mean we want to do the right thing but we also want to be be realistic and right. and know that people are going to call mm -hmm. in from time to time about performance issues mm -hmm. um what we do do is we track all of them so whether it's a performance issue right. or a misconduct issue we do what's called a complaint tracking form mm -hmm. and so i can tell you if you were to ask us show me all of your complaint tracking forms okay. and how you handle things. So if somebody came back later and said, yeah, hey, why you know, didn't you follow up maybe on we this handled this performance issue and then they contacted the PAB or the ACC, um, we could then produce for you, here's what we did, here's how we handled it. Right. Um, and we also never handle something and don't have communication with the person who called in. Mm -hmm. So they're going to get a follow-up call mm -hmm. from at the supervisor or higher and we talk to them, we say, hey, this, this is how we handle it. The officer's going to come back out. They're going to take a report, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the that best satisfies. thing you can do yeah. because, you know, uh, maintaining that communication with that citizen is really what it's all about. Yeah. I guess we have to keep in mind where this whole legislation came from. And it right. Wasn't officer Smith sleeping in his car, you know, in Del Mar. That, that was a performance issue. It was but if it was called in by a citizen, <coughs> and right. a citizen noticed that, then it becomes a citizen contact, but it's more of a performance issue. Right. And That's then there's right. kind of a gray area gray as area. to where, where does it go. If mm -hmm. Officer right. Smith and Del Mar is using excessive force or, or uh, uh, you know, right. using mm -hmm. a citizen or, or there's perception of that, that I think is where this legislation came from. So I think that's what we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to understand the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. Tom's talking about the spirit of the law, and, and we should be handling the 
performance issues and dealing with those things. Mm -hmm. And the letter of the law says something different. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes. Do we have the ability as uh, the ACC if we getting the referrals from wherever? Would one of the options uh, be, uh, you know, we don't take action and refer this back to the agency because we see this as meeting the guidelines and performance issues? So the, the, by the time the ACC gets it, what you're going to get is an investigation. What we're going to get is an investigation. Well, there's going to be police reports, and if there's not going to be, assuming right. it's not going to generate police reports on performance issues. There is no consultation with you. The only thing that you truly get right. is, a, it's the, is an investigation to make a determination right. on it's the, discipline. The only, that flow chart that Calvert County did, I think we need to adopt that, Mr. Burke, on our website because I think that really does a nice job of it. The only, so the, the PAB will get citizen complaints. The agencies will get citizen complaints. And both of those then get handled by the agency in terms of that investigation, much of it falling on. I was just thinking if there could plate. be some, you know, I mean, what I'm hearing is the officers get, you know, citizen complaints and maybe they're misinformed that we sit as some sort of overarching authority. Right. And they're not going to satisfy that citizen until it gets forward to us. As a yeah, so maybe there's a and way. there's a way we can say, Thank you, but this really is right. a performance issue, right. and, give, and then that citizen can, can hear it from the officer saying we're doing everything we can. Do what but you that's want. kind of similar to what we, we, you and I, and Colonel Hart went back and forth with. Just to give you mm -hmm. a, a real quick, we did an extreme risk protective order. We seized a number of weapons out of a house. That individual went to a hearing. Judge decided that that not to put the risk order in place. Ordered the weapons back to the individual. We communicated with the individual and said come pick up your weapons. Our policy is not to take weapons to someone's house and release it to them at the residence. He says, no, you took my weapons, you bring them to me. We went back and said, sorry, you want your guns, you come up here and schedule an appointment. It's not that easy. We'll, we'll go through the weapons and give them back to you. He's sending it to Tim. He's then eventually he decides I'll send it to Stacy and, and send something to her and we go back and forth and that's not a yeah, it's legitimate not. complaint. It's a policy issue right. that w it's our policy that this is how it's done. If you want those guns, then you got to come here and do it. And there was consultation with Stacy, and I believe Stacy, you sent them something that I said this is not a. Right. So I don't know if it's if yeah. it's at her level that she can then <laughs> decide this is performance. This is well. I think part of it. I think part of it might be. It might be useful, and I'm just like talking off the top of my head, but it might be useful to have. Um, and I have not looked at the county website for the Police Accountability Board in terms of what the links are that we have on there. But I think in terms of, because it's all new for all of us as well as for the citizens. So I think maybe a little bit of educational information on that website that we can direct people to might be helpful. Mm -hmm. And part of that would be some standardized complaint form that maybe has even language on it so we can pull out those matters which are significant and those matters which are more procedural in nature, policy in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and number two, I think that the citizens need to understand how it flows mm -hmm. and how, how much or how little either of these boards really have in terms of discretion to make the kinds of pronouncements that that gentleman was looking for, which was basically, I'll put those guns in the back of my car and I'm gonna take them to him. Um, Cause that's really what he was looking right. for. But, um, and I was not willing to do that. So, <laughs> plus I have two car seats in the back of my car. It just right, would not, right, right. <laughs> not gonna logistically. work. Just logistically <laughs> would not work. Um, yeah, so I think that's something that we as the, account the accountability board can work on generating some content for that web page that helps you keep it common sense mm -hmm. as to what you handle within your agency and what actually is the fodder that we're supposed to be dealing with. Are we allowed to consult or work with the permanent chair to, to discuss 
or is that out of the context of what? I wouldn't think so. You, you have to maintain the Chinese wall. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that is a good question. I think, as to your point, is to have some sort of framework of what right. would constitute right. a performance issue. And then I guess, obviously, we would need some input from right. law enforcement for you to maybe and to, so and maybe, would you make that decision like like to that point would it come to you first and then you would say it comes to the, i'm not even coming to this it this comes is not to the coming police before. accountability board right any complaints come to us we have to immediately forward them to the agency involved right so i mean if it's that's an our, obvious that's performance our issue is right. my question then does that get stopped kind of at that point or does that go back to you guys well, that, what i'm thinking is if we had a complaint form that created almost its own funnel effects mm -hmm. so that we could limit those matters which were truly misconduct issues that we then refer for investigation. That's what I'm thinking. So and that would be a nice way to track it because I'm sure most of these people are like, I'm not doing it, I'm calling. Well, so and I'm unfortunately, just, right, right, some of, you know, s the reality is some of the individuals who are going to be complaining are challenging in the way that that gentleman was in terms of a bit of perhaps some underlying mental health issues driving the bus. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, that is, uh, that is oftentimes when you're dealing with members of the public, you're often confronted with, with those kinds of issues. But what I'm thinking of right now is if I could get all of the agencies just to send send it to me and then I'll forward it to the accountability board, just a copy of what your current complaint form is. Um, that way I've got what, what you guys are working with and then we can put our heads together and maybe tweak it a little bit so we have one form that is then consistent throughout the county, throughout the agencies, and hopefully can kind of focus in on those things that we really need to be focused on. Does that make sense? And you said you had a flow chart that you liked from another jurisdiction yeah, that Calvert might work? Yeah, County. Mm -hmm. I'll forward that to, to everyone, too. Yeah. Did, so, Stacey, did that? Frederick County, County does have one, too. too. Did that chart address, like, if the complaint comes to the officers himself? Yes. And then, okay, so it's both yeah. ways. Yeah. Because I think that's still the question, correct? Chief I'll Thomas, like, that, if the complaint I'll comes to you. I'll send that out again. Yeah, yeah I'll so send that flow chart out again. And maybe we can adopt, maybe Carroll County can adopt that flow chart, tweak it and make our own slightly modified version of it. Yeah. Real quick, for the board. Yeah. Um, Doug and I were just sitting here talking because it is a common uh, practice. Jimmy DeWeese pulls me over. Which okay, could I'm happen. driving down the road. <laughs> yeah. His typical state. Are you state, a bad driver? I am a former, I'm a former trooper. His typical, so state, <laughs> his typical state trooper mentality comes out. Hey, watch so it. Any, <laughs> so anyway, no, he pulls me over. I'm just not happy with him pulling me over. Right. I'm not happy with him giving me a citation. Right. And I deem him as rude and unprofessional when, in fact, he was just being stern. Right. How far do you want to go with that? Yeah, that's the that, question, I mean, isn't honestly, it? Honestly, that's a Reader's Digest summary. Right. It could be summed up by body-worn camera. Right. A, a, a ton of things. Right. And I guess it's like when we're dealing with like the – he's, he's got – one, he's got one IID guy. Mm -hmm. Most of us have none. Right. So we're kind of just that could get become a daunting task for us yes. as well as Mark. Right. So it's just like it, right. Where do we call that cat? Okay. Mark's Mark's got something to say or Rich. I can kind of answer that. What we're doing, if it's not a violation of our policy, if somebody calls and said the example is, I was pulled over and this happened, mm -hmm. and the deputy approached my car in a stealth manner, and it was unacceptable. We reviewed that, and there's no policy violation. Right. So we we documented it, called him back, and said there's no policy violation. We would never send that to you because there's no mm -hmm. policy violation. That's the way we're handling this, quote unquote, inquiry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is that here's I think the issue? You might get complaints about that. Right. Direct from, directly from the citizens. And then we're looking right. at a complaint and doing an internal investigation. That Tom brings up a valid point about the preliminary inquiry. Mm -hmm. So we would look at body-worn camera footage and in-car camera footage and 
and so forth to figure out. And then we find out that a violation did not occur. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to get tied up doing a lengthy investigation. Right, on something send, that it doesn't warrant. So it's unfounded. You know, it's no need to even really go any further. So at what point, how do we handle that? What's, I guess that's the question we're it's really looking at getting at. How we, how we phone that? a policy complaint. violation, there's no complaint. Well, I think that there is one thing that, that Chief Hess brought up that, that is a policy violation, which is rude or civility. And that's mm -hmm. typically a matter of perception. And it can be right. driven by somebody who has just written right. a motor vehicle citation. So, you know, I, I think that there, I think there has to be some flexibility built into this process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're just going to drive officers out of the profession mm -hmm. to allow us to have the first bite at the apple on something that's a perception issue like that. Mm -hmm. So, in other words. You know, I get a call from somebody who's just written a citation. You know, Officer Ledwell was rude um, during this traffic stop. Mm -hmm. We go, we look at the body worn camera. Typically, what we would do prior to this process is that unless there was uh, an obvious misconduct on the part of the officer, we would recontact the citizen and say, you know, we reviewed it, we understand mm -hmm. your concerns. We'll pass along the concerns, have the officer speak with the supervisor, you know, and, and that's typically satisfactory on behalf of the citizen. Right. Um, I would hate to see those all turn into formal complaints that we have to do something on paper mm -hmm. that goes up through the ACC, the officer's under stress the whole right. time. Um, the question is, how do we, I mean, I think, I think personally I can speak for our department that we do a good job within our policy kind of writing that into place. But, you know, I guess I would ask for you guys to read over and okay. maybe give us some feedback right. on, on what you think. Right. Um, because I don't think, I, I, I think that there's good intention behind the legislation, but they obviously didn't think out all of the oh, yeah, there's logistics a lot. of this whole thing. There's a lot of logistics. That and there's there. a lot of times we'll talk to them because you hit the nail on the head, man. <clears throat> it's talking to the citizen or the mm -hmm. person making the complaint. And you can lessen that and talk to them, and then they understand and it's abated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There may be time you have to jack up the officer a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's all gone, and it's just taking it, like Tom said, you get them to that level where they think there's going to be an accountability board review and then a subsequent trial board, they, they stress out. Mm -hmm. sure. Unfortunately, John, some of your Baltimore City talk gets them a little turned off with that Baltimore City. Uh... Dude, I got the gift of God. <laughs> you keep talking like that. <laughs> well, and the other issue is that, as you know, performance issues are best handled timely. Oh, mm -hmm. And this process is not timely. Right. Um, yeah. There's right. bureaucracy built, built into it. So... You know, if, if the true intention is to, to be good um, supervisors, good leaders, I would like the ability to handle a performance issue too sweet mm -hmm. versus have it drag mm -hmm. out for a month. I can tell Mr. Uh, I'm having, I guess, a conceptual issue. Me too. Being rude is not crime. Right. <laughs> but it is a policy it's violation. It's a performance issue. Performance, performance issue. issue. If you've got an officer that, you know, has a psychological issue or, or a personality problem, I mean, all those real tough things that we, you know, have to work with in the workplace. I mean, you know, you, you hired him. You got to deal with him, mm -hmm. you know. And but unless he commits a crime, I don't know. But the letter I, of the I, law. I report, I but the letter of the law. Right. It's a citizen's complaint. Right. This is a complaint from a, okay. the letter of the law says this is a citizen complaint okay, that has to go up through. We're on the, the, Correct. At what, this so point, we're, we're the criminal phase, and right. I think the other side. So we'll, can, okay, can but I'll that. stop you. The letter of the law says that that requires a full-blown investigation that would eventually show up on your desk right. to make a disciplinary right. action on. Mm -hmm. It doesn't dis, It doesn't decide what's performance. It, it's or also what's, it's what's it's misconduct. not only a law violation, but it's a policy violation, right. and that's what's considered misconduct. Right. So, I could write out of our policies everything that mentions, you know. Um, civility, right. performance, right. Um, but you know we'd like to have standards too. Yeah, exactly. So um, th that, where I think, is where the devil's in the detail. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think we ought to have a common understanding, and I think it ought to be 
across the across board. The so agencies. I'm not doing something a certain way, right? And, right. And yeah. other departments yeah. doing it a different way because yeah. that's not fair to our so, officers. In Baltimore, if you go back, we had the Civilian Review Board. There was an Accountability r Review okay. Board. Ellen Schwartz. I don't know if you were there, Mike, when she was there. She was an administrative judge out of New York, and they brought her down to be the administrative judge and overlooking internal mm -hmm. affairs. And I kind of liked their attitude with it because at the time I was an IID. There was an influx of complaints like this, and I'm talking okay. 60, 70, 80 a week. The rudeness kind of. The rudeness. Yeah, okay. She finally said, look, enough's enough. If it's discourtesy, short of them cussing out an 80-year-old woman, I don't want to hear about it right. because it's not discourtesy. Because then it was a time of verbal judo and all this other type of tactics that were going mm -hmm. on. So she kind of like came down to a, uh, what they call it, a command investigation? Summary management? Yeah, okay. something. Like, it kind of like yeah. summarized it. Yeah. And it didn't go to a full-blown book. Gotcha. So I guess. Okay, so I've got a question. You've got for, to document it, but it's not a full-blown book. I've got book. a question for Mark. When you're faced with this kind of thing, what do you do? So the. Do you get it to begin with? Well, I think to Mr. Larimore's um, discussion there, that the law it, it gives three bullets of what police misconduct is. Right. The last one is the one that we're kind of talking about, but and the one that we usually will operate in, which is a violation of department policy. Okay. So if the deputy violates department policy, it is a disciplinary matter that, that we would handle. And it, then it would, if it involves a citizen, that's when the ACC then has jurisdiction gotcha. over it. So if it does not, if it is not right. one of those three bullets in the definition of police misconduct, then the ACC has nothing to There's do no with it. Part in it. And it's not, and the sheriff's office is taking the stance that it's not a complaint. Right. And just like Colonel Hart mentioned, that, that citizen that complained that two deputies showed up and the one approached her car in a stealth manner, Neither of those two things are a violation of our policy. So this is the first test that we, that the Colonel and I meet with, and this is the right. first test that we apply. We read it and we say, if everything in here were true, would it be a violation? A violation, or would it be, right. would it be police misconduct? If the answer is yes, then we go one route. Right. If the answer is no, we don't have a complaint, we don't have police misconduct, I don't do an internal investigation. It doesn't go to the ACC. Right. There's no dis because there's nothing wrong with it. So maybe what we can do as the accountability board is come up with some guidelines in terms of what that policy says that are helpful. And one of the guidelines, if I could add, might be not an instance of rudeness or maybe an understandable or there's an explanation, but right. you're starting to see an officer that's you know getting a lot of complaints a pattern. about a lot of pattern yeah. or early intervention system. Conduct, intervention. or words of the, to those effect where you know a, as a supervisor suddenly he's on your radar as someone that needs supervision and maybe training and and you know and 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 that's where maybe we could be useful mm -hmm. to assist you in counseling this officer or weeding him out whichever is, is more appropriate uh, and saying, listen, you know, um, you're at the threshold where if I don't see improvement, we're going to we're going to be before the ACC together. You know, I'm sorry you, you're, you're putting us in this position, but that's where we're at. You know, and, and, and then when we get a rudeness or complaint, you know, we're we're not treating it as well. This guy just had a bad day. The first time. Or, or, right? Yeah, this is, you know, not only does a citizen have a problem, but, you know, Sheriff Deweese has a problem with this guy. We need mm -hmm. to take a look at this. Well, Yes. Uh, two two observations. Yes. The first one is about the, the matrix ex, ex, itself and performance issues. Okay. I, the, Which I have alone, admittedly not read cover to cover, nor do I have a working knowledge of it. it it's a work of art. Uh, yeah. <laughs> some of the lowest provisions, lateness for duty, uniform violations, are listed as, as a disciplinary matter. Right. And I can guarantee you probably no one ever, a citizen never complains that an officer was late for duty. It's always something within the department. So that's still a trial board issue under the strict mm -hmm. interpretation of the matrix. And but if I tried to hand a deputy something like that, I promise you they'd run it right up to exactly. the trial board. And Why and wouldn't they? That's what they're going right. to do. Since Why that's in there, you know, everybody that gets a lateness for duty is going to ask for a trial board, mm -hmm. which is, I don't know that they can because it's not a citizen complaint. It's, it's one right. of those conundrums they can. this matrix. Yeah. Right. The second thing is about the three points that the, the uh, lieutenant mentioned. 
the statute, you know, that, that uh, outlined misconduct. Mm -hmm. The first one is a constitutional violation, federal or state. Who amongst us is going to say, you know, understands the Constitution well enough to say that the officer's conduct violated the Constitution? <laughs> you didn't. Uh, well, Good to me. Well, I, I did a lot of civil rights litigation. I did a lot of civil rights litigation where the Constitution w was uh, an issue. Mm -hmm. And it went to federal court, it went to the Fourth Circuit, and maybe even went to the Supreme Court right. to tell me whether that was a constitutional violation or not. So to ask these chiefs of police right. to look at an investigation and say, yep, that's a constitutional violation, well, did you take into consideration qualified immunity? Maryland has state or statutory immunity. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the federal has qualified immunity. Who amongst us is going to right. go through all it's that ridiculous. analysis for yeah. what they claim to be a constitutional mm -hmm. violation? Mm -hmm. And if someone uh, uh, claims that they were arrest, arrested without probable cause, that's a Fourth Amendment violation. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, who's who's going to say that they by that violated the, the uh, federal constitution? So the, the, the statute is going to be in court for years. Mm -hmm. And I keep hoping there's a... Uh, <coughs> A, a statute introduced or a legislation introduced to correct right. a lot of these errors. Right. So far, agreed. I think, I think we're going to be waiting a little bit for yeah. that. Yeah. But in the meantime, <clears throat> we can do our part to be a little more common sense. Yeah. Stacey, I, oh, I think. Sorry. I think first you, then you. I think one of the problems is that every jurisdiction kind of does it differently. So we could come up with a very common sense process here to let you guys do your job, and then somebody else in another county does it differently. And they, they designed think that's it the way that it should way, be I done, think. and they're pointing fingers at you guys, or pointing fingers at us, to my because word. we do it differently here. Even the makeup of you definitely. was mm -hmm. was left to the jurisdictions to yes. come up with and right. and create the ordinance so that you exist. But each county, Does if you read their ordinance, yes, it's it's literally yes. from here to here. It's completely off the spectrum. Right, that's true. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, Thomas, to your point, is there an opportunity here for to err on the side of transparency? and help relieve the burden from you all as chiefs in just reporting all of this information to us monthly or quarterly um, schedule so similar to this where we're just given the information this is what happened that took place in the city and we review it it doesn't mean we're investigating it right but we can look through this well, we have really patterns. our job too is to Correct. just review the data but just like send all trends. of the information I know it's a lot for us to come through but that way there's not something left out we're not missing patterns with officers potentially and then you can go back to citizens and say this has been passed along to the accountability board what we do with it then we can communicate back to the officers or whatever but is it are we at a level where we can err on that side of transparency for the sake of both sides I think that comes down to whether it makes sense and logistically is doable I think the we're, we're all not going to be here in the future, and neither will any of you. Right. And if we don't create a process that, makes that sense. supersedes our existence yes. for the next group, we're all getting along just fine right now. Right. And, and we all probably have the same mindset that we want to hold people accountable. We don't want bad cops. But we may, we're not going to exist in the future. And what we put on paper mm -hmm. and decide how it goes mm -hmm. is a document that's breathable and, and living that can be massaged for the future. But it's got to be something that we could all work from right. if we're not here anymore. And, and this is the infancy of this organization, you yeah. guys and us. And you, we've got a good, solid group, I think, that could put some, some documentation together to make sure that, mm -hmm. that future organizations and future groups look at this and, and do it the right way. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I yes. have a question, too. So I, I actually liked your, your initial proposal to get a copy of all of mm -hmm. like the current complaint forms right. along with probably each one of your recommendations of the top performance type issues that you get on a regular basis right because that's typically what you're going to come across these are pretty consistent types of per performance type things and then we could enumerate them in this form like these following items would constitute a performance and may not, not rise to the right. level of the uh, police accountability board on that form and when they're filling it out I think to your point we would get all right. we have the opportunity to get all of these from the citizen that fills it out and then you I guess as the chair would could either review that and say I've determined this is not appropriate for any sort of next step action for mm -hmm. the board and then um, at least everybody, like you said, could right. see whatever comes to that right. process. But I think that's a more creates uh, a record focused, being, yeah. Instead of having every everything concept. come to us, because I, I think you guys are going to deal with this locally at a much more efficient level 
Um, and then, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it gives that citizen the opportunity to go to that site, fill out the form. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if they're <coughs> taking the time to fill out the form, because mm -hmm. that's part of it too, it's easy to pick up the phone, call, right. complain in the, in the heat of a moment. But mm -hmm. if you're taking the time to fill out a form, it you're means more. You're going to see the categories. Yeah, right. it means more to you. You've read all the stuff. I think it gives everybody the opportunity to get the. So I would mm -hmm. like that to get a copy of what you're currently doing now to you, and then we can see it. And work then on top, top issues yeah, that, you see as performance issues that you would typically see. And we'll consult with Mr. Burke so that we can come up with one that keeps us straight with the legislative intent, but also, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking out, I'm thinking in my head right now, which is always um, scary, um, but something that does identify by category certain sort of common complaints, maybe even offering an example of something that constitutes a policy violation versus something that constitutes an actual citizen driven complaint so that and then even have language in there to again educate the public so that they know that policy driven complaints are not going to be ignored they will be addressed by the agency involved within their standard protocol but, you know, if your complaint falls within one of those categories, don't think that it's being ignored, but just know that it's not going to come to the ACC ultimately. Um, something along that line, I think, might be a helpful. Does that? I think it would be. I mean, I agree. Like listen, with... you're pra pragmatic. I don't, we got to make sure that, that, yeah. that if, if the person that's in your seat understands right. that it's written that way that the person's in your seat in the future right. understand it understands that that's the process yeah the only thing that would be at issue is if you agree and i disagree mm -hmm. that that is a policy slash yeah right um, right then, then where does then where does it go yeah. beyond that i mean i don't it, it, ultimately if there's an impasse then we would investigate and yeah and, and right so so that's the only issue um okay so I think in terms of just so the, this is what I do when I have mediation. I give people homework. So my homework <laughs> that I'm going to assign to the agencies is send me a copy of your existing complaint form and send me information that you think is helpful in terms of parsing out policy matters. You know, you don't have to get down into the weeds on it, but just behaviors that you feel constitute policy violations within your departments versus the obvious things which are you know some some assaultive behaviors and that kind of thing you know just so that we've got some meat to work with to come up with a standardized complaint form that we, helps we can almost give you that as we're sitting here because they would be categorized as <coughs> as in the matrix in a b or in a, or a c and they okay. would traditionally have been summary punishment that at, Mike was a barrack commander, I was a barrack commander of state police. Okay. We would have been handling at the barrack level in a summary punishment way. Anything right. that would be a, be a D or an E would be a fireable offense then would have gone to internal affairs or the permanent <laughs> so chair of the hearing board. So you're referencing the matrix. That, right. So the matrix a, typically B, dissects yeah. those things that are lower level that should be handled by the agency. In fact. I tried okay. to submit legislation last year that said summary punishment within the matrix would be A, B, and C, would mm -hmm. be handled regardless of whether it was a citizen contact by the, by the jurisdiction itself, categories D's okay. and E's, and I think now they have F's, I don't know what they have in the matrix now, right. but they would have been processed by the ACC, okay. um, but, but they didn't, they didn't like the that. Okay. So, All right. Not yes. only that, but the matrix also allows for what you said, sir, about the repeat, repeat offenses. It kicks it up to the it next higher level right. if, it's okay. two, right. if it's two or more <laughs> complaints that are similar nature over a period of time. So it's, right. it's all built into that. Uh, I think it's, it's it depends on the violation. Well, we're going to, so here, just timeline for you. Um, Mike is going to be doing his training. Not until April now. Oh, they bumped you? I had to bump it back. I have um, to Okay, first, all right. First. Well, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. So he's April we're april and then we've got a tentative acc has a tentative first meeting date 
Bethany. May 3rd. May 3rd. May 3rd. Wednesday, Wednesday, May 3rd. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 11 o'clock. All right, good. Um, so we'll, we'll get our matrix. We'll get our matrix in order <laughs> between now and then. Um, and Madam Chair, the, my point is, is, I think for the forum, it's for the citizenry. Obviously, yes. you guys understand the right. Matrix. This is for A the lot citizens. Clear, so, correct. I think right. the point that you want to have is yes, to, it's about educating yeah. the public. Right. And, and so we, and need, we need something that can be easily understood by them, that yeah. this is a performance matter that will be referred back to the department. You know, I think right. that eliminates a lot of this question marks from you guys, if we can try to get to some level of right. stuff that can be... And I think it's a combination of education and also um, setting expectations. Managing expectations. Oh, yeah. Yes, managing public... Yes, thank you. That was the word I was looking for. I just didn't have it. Managing public expectations in terms of what this process is about and how it's being driven. And I think it'll help clear up, like, yeah. we know what should be at this level. Like, it, when you see it, you're going to know it, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's just clear clarifying that to right. make it so that you're not concerned about these performance issues ending up here incorrectly. I mm -hmm. mean, right. and then causing you all this problem and each individual officer for the stressors that we don't the, need. Yeah, exactly. 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 So I've given you all homework. Our homework is going to be when we get the information from the agencies, work on addressing that and coming up with a standardized complaint form in conjunction with Mr. Burke's office. And then we'll, then we'll get back to all of you and hopefully go from there in terms of further. And I also want to, Tim, I'd also like to look at the, our website and see, you know, we can add that complaint form there and maybe some other that, I like that flow chart. And I'll send that flow chart out to everyone too. Yes. Has, has anybody been through the training? Through MPTC? Yeah. Well, that's, isn't it a little disappointing that they didn't clear this up? No. Wow. Well, <laughs> that that but, but Tim, there's no standardized pursuit policies that come out of MPTC. There's okay. no standardized anything really that we can grab onto that is universal within all law enforcement. Um, right. It just says you have to have a policy, and it's got to be in these these parameters. So we look to MPTC for an awful lot. You're wasting your time. There's not an awful lot that comes out of there. You would think the state would put the mandate to, to out there say give police departments this as a policy. They don't do that. Right. Very very few things. Interesting. Yeah. It's just even on the uh, like IA Pro, Mike Mike Spaulding will tell you the amount of money that costs a small town right. with a small budget is ridiculous. Right. You would <laughs> that think. tracking. So I'm not buying IA Pro, and I've decided not to feed into the monopoly of IA Pro okay. because they are salivating and they're pushing legislation to make sure everybody has something like this so they can oh, get fat right. and happy. Well, I mean, it so we've decided that we're, we're creating our own system in order to track and monitor as opposed to giving them 30000 40000 mm. a year based on the size of my organization. Right. It's just ridiculous what right. they're charging for for tracking and monitoring and and with a small police department they they know intimately all these people and exactly what's going on sure and even in, in a medium-sized police department we know what's mm -hmm. going on and who the issues are I, I, when tom's done out you'll hear from colonel hart on our statistics and you'll be disappointed if you're mm -hmm. going to sit here and think that you're going to hear a bunch of trial board cases right. and a bunch of misconduct and rogue cops, you're going to be very disappointed. It's mm -hmm. just simply not yeah. the case. So thank you because we did. I got off my I got off my schedule. So Tom's, are you? Oh, appreciate the disappointment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Appreciate yeah. the disappointment. <laughs> right. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. so I will turn to Sheriff. Rich department. will give you those things. That, um, we haven't done a trial board, and I've been the sheriff in eight plus years, mm -hmm. and I don't think anybody to the left of me has had a trial board. Um, in the eight plus years that I've been the sheriff. So if you're here to listen to trial boards regularly, I'm hoping that you're gonna be disappointed. Mm -hmm. The issue is, is that the legislation may force more trial boards than we've had in years past because deputies, officers, troopers might say, and they're probably getting direction from their fraternal organizations mm -hmm. to go to a trial board and right. inundate you with trial boards because they're very 
cumbersome and they take a lot of time to put together because they mimic the same thing you're used to. Could you explain from the officer's standpoint of view why he'd be getting that advice? And there, and there's obviously a tax for there. that simple reason to inundate because there's a time period by which when an internal investigation starts from the time that you're supposed to hear it as a trial board and make a disposition on it right. that in some cases if they inundate you you're not going to you're never going to that you're never going to be able to meet right. and so the process for a trial board mimics exactly what you're used to in the district or circuit court <clears throat> that there are procedures that of evidentiary value right. and there's are, there are motions that take place that come through that have to be decided upon before that board sits and hears the case and so it does take time but and what's so the penalty if it doesn't if it's a lapse is it dismissed yeah it's gone and your ACC findings, whether it's a trial board or not, is going to be the same. If somebody takes, if, you go, if it goes to the right. ACC and you're a sustained complaint for whatever, and mm -hmm. you say because it's a matrix, there's a, a letter of reprimand. Yeah. They can go to trial board and it's when you find them guilty, it's going to be a letter of reprimand. The matrix is the matrix. So, so there's, there's no there's no, no. penalty right. and then taking right. the trial board. The, the, the right. Right. There, there, there's, there's no is. plea bargaining anymore. Yeah, the there is no plea bargaining. It's the matrix. There right. is because I can I still have the authority to increase the yes. violation. I don't have the authority to make to it decrease less. it. Right. So you can't increase it and put it because he took a trial board. I can increase it because I probably know factors about the right. case that you may not know, but I can increase it, yes, and then then the circuit court can file an, you can file an injunction with the circuit court or a stay. I, I, I disagree. I don't think the trial we were told at the at the commission's training that the trial board finding is final. Period. Right. That when no, it comes I think it's a, it is ultimately appealable to circuit court. I mean, as far as as far as coming back to the agency, right. once a trial board makes a determination, right? Because the deputy that's can also it. take the sheriff's decision to a trial board. So if it's not an ACC matter, right? And the sheriff says, right. I'm placing that they can take that to a trial board. Right. So the trial board's decision. However, the matrix is the matrix. The matrix is the matrix. And everybody's beholden to the matrix. If you did this, this is well, what it, it, gives, it gives a range. There's a, yeah, there's a range. Right. So there's yeah. some... There's wiggle room within. Yes, yes, yes. So real quick, I'll, uh, so we're close to having body worn camera and in car camera. We're doing okay. both okay. the combined system. <laughs> this summer we'll have 119 uh, patrol deputies with with the combination, and then all of my CID, SWAT, um, uh, everybody else will have the body worn camera. Okay. So even my SWAT team will have them when they're doing. Um, drug enforcement raids those sort of things my investigators um, even my drug investigators will have them when they're doing specific cases that need a body worn camera on them so that we can we can grab that footage um, and that that is uh, we we're on a timeline for for this summer the reason it's not as easy for me is because the amount of data that will come in from from my cameras with right. 140 of them um, I've got to have people in place that will look at that data when we flip the switch for it with the amount of um, discovery requests and MPIA requests. Right. The, the bulk of the work comes with the MPIA requests. The discovery um, simply goes to the state's attorney for um, them to review and make their, their redactions. Mm -hmm. But the MPIA request requires a lot of redaction and the ability to do that. There is redaction software that we're all, I'm sure, trying to buy to help the redaction better. But so that, to give you a quick example, if we go to Walmart for a theft, and the deputy turns a body camera on because they're walking back to loss prevention and they walk past 800 people in the Walmart. Those people have to be redacted. Wow. Um, when they get to the loss prevention and start dealing with something, if a clerk that has nothing to do with it walks out, everything's got to be redacted. So if they have nothing to do with the actual arrest, that it's redacted from their footage. So that's kind of what the state's attorney truly needs to do. The traffic stops, those sort of things that we get involved in where an MPIA request comes in. That stuff has to be redacted by our people. So there's a lot of issues. The camera equipment and even the storage, storage is the cheap part. The expensive part of all these cameras is the people that are behind trying to redact and get it right so that they can send it for um, discovery for prosecution or for MPIA requests, traffic crashes, um, traffic stops, those sort of things that would come out of our offices. So the, the cameras, albeit are great, they take quite a bit of effort right. to, to administer. They just do. Um, again, I told you we haven't had a trial board in eight plus years, and I simply don't believe we will um, if we're doing everything uh, correctly. 
Um, the, the colonel will give you stats on that here in a second. Um, there is a, uh, not that I don't know that it has to do with the ACC and the PAB as much, but um, there is a push to take any um, use of force where there's a death that results mm -hmm. in it, really not only away from the agency like mine to investigate, but right. currently the state's attorney from mm -hmm. making a determination of whether it's prosecuted or not. The conflict with me in that is that the attorney general wants those cases to make a determination whether they should prosecute one of my deputies, but the attorney general also represents me in civil cases. Yeah. So um, simply don't understand, you want to talk about conflicts, that's about as big. So you can turn around and decide you want to charge my deputy with a crime, and then that, that individual could come along and sue me civilly for having that deputy and the deputy and everything that goes along with it, but then the AG is going to have to represent me when it comes to civil lawsuits as well. So that's a push in Annapolis. I think that makes it through. It sounds like it made it out of the Senate, and it's in the House this week to try and make a determination whether it gets out of there. The House tends to send stuff through a little quicker, and then it would go to the full House and Senate for a vote, whether it makes it through it or not, and it could ultimately be, be law. And that's concerning to me, and it's concerning um, locally. All 24 states attorneys are against it. They want the jurisdiction over it, um, but I don't know how much drag they have. Um, aside from that, I think you, you said we had long discussion on uh, cases and complaints, and I am here to tell you that I know all of the gentlemen to the left of me and their officers, and the, the amount of complaints that you, we get um, is so nominal, and it should be that way. We have such a good relationship with the people that we're out there protecting, and when the Colonel gives you some use of forge statistics, the use of force policies have changed. So um, it used to be if we pulled our gun, um, that wasn't a use of force. If mm -hmm. we pull it and point it at someone, that's now considered a use of force. If we pull a taser out and tell somebody, put your hands up um, and, and threaten to use it, uh, it, we never really documented those things. Mm -hmm. now, now we've got to document all these things. So it may appear as though use of force is up, but when we talk about actual force, um, it's extremely nominal in, in the amount of interactions that we have with people throughout the county. Thank you. Thank um, you. For last quarter, we had zero complaints. There were no internal affairs complaints. We had three uses of force last quarter. Um, one was a taser deployment. Mm -hmm. Two were what we call takedown of muslings, where we had to physically take somebody to the ground and, mm -hmm. and put them in handcuffs. No baton strikes, no taser. Um, discharges. One of those muscling techniques was from a carper suit. We had one carper suit so far this year. We had one last year also, where the, the gentleman would not come. We, we had to physically remove her from the car. Mm -hmm. So, in perspective, for last year, the sheriff's office, the Carroll County Sheriff's Office, made 1,198 arrests, adult arrests. We made 110 juvenile arrests, 179 DUI arrests, and we took 300 people into custody for emergency petitions. That means emergency evaluation, mm -hmm. 300, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So with all that, we had seven complaints last year from all those contacts with citizens. And that doesn't count the traffic stops. I think we made 17,000 traffic stops last year, the contacts we've had. So we had seven complaints. Um, of those seven, six were sustained mm -hmm. by us. Um, and they were for attendance, neglect of duty. We had an accidental discharge of a taser. Somebody was in roll call. And, in the station, the taser, they were trying We to call those stupid cop tricks. <laughs> <laughs> um, it happens, so fortunately it's just taser. It's what we call conformance with rules. And of those, one was a citizen's complaint that is awaiting the ACC to be developed so we can, excuse me, so we can send it to you. And that, that internal investigation is finished. We sustained it. Well, we're not allowed to sustain it, but we felt it. And it will fall in what we talked about earlier as an A, B, or a C matrix, okay. a summary okay. punishment right. type of um, If it had been ours, it would have been a B, probably. Um, so last year, our uses of force, we had 47 uses of force last year. Of those uses of force, um, 27 what we call take down our muscles. Okay? And, and we go back, last year we had no complaints of excessive force and brutality at all through mm -hmm. those, those seven complaints, not one. Um, again, like the sheriff said, we had 14 more complaints than we did the following year because we enacted the policy when we pulled our weapon out and pointed at somebody that's now using force. We had 14 right. of those. We had no 
OC spray deployments, where we sprayed somebody at all last year. We had nine taser deployments where we pointed at folks. Mm -hmm. Only two times do we discharge that, the taser. Just twice, through all those contacts we've had with folks <coughs> last year. And um, I believe that covers it. Uh, uh, two baton, two, two strikes. One was with a hand, one was with a baton. And that was, as far as our complaints, for the amount of contacts we had, mm -hmm. we'd have very few uses of force and even less complaints right. overall. And we're pre we screen our complaints. I mean, we're, right. If we get a complaint and we have a problem with the deputy, it's handled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is there any question on? No, that's. Mm -hmm. I've got one question. So yeah. is there any policy for um, body worn camera footage of how a time frame for that to be released because I've noticed like over departments like some release right away. It depends on the it two depends weeks, on the incident itself. I mean so I, I have tremendous issue with the fact that the attorney general releases any body worn camera footage on an active investigation that they have. As a defense attorney I can't imagine you wouldn't either. There is legislation I mean I mean you just absolutely taint a pool of people that could right. potentially see that. It's a piece of evidence that you are actually letting people see and make a determination whether the officer was right or wrong. I have incredible anxiety with the fact that anybody would release that footage. They claim that they release it in public trans transparency reasons to keep uh, uh, civil disturbance issues from taking place so that it's, there's, there's transparency there. Um, th as far as body worn camera, I, I, these guys have had them. I don't have them right yet and so we will have policies on when to release them <clears throat> these guys are probably better at so i can tell you our policy distinguishes between evidence uh, non-evidentiary mm. um, we have had mpia requests they typically are uh, through civil attorneys that accompany some type of domestic situation or a collision where it's, you know insurance company wants footage We've consulted with the state's attorney's office. State's attorney's office says that the, 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 the law allows for discretion for those, but that they recommend not releasing anything that is pending adjudication. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't, as a matter of policy. Stuff that is going to be like a, an issue that's a hot button topic, uh, use of force with an officer, that's going to be up to the IID, to the AG's office as far as when they were going to that's if it results in the death or right. potential death Correct. of the individual they had okay. contact that's with usually right. within 24 hours i believe isn't it if i they thought, release i thought it was okay. like 14 yeah. days is when they it's pretty cool <coughs> it's, 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 it's better 14 so there was something that popped into my brain sorry i know i'm going out of order here that that's when okay. um, colonel hart was talking that came up in the commission's training and i think that you're going to have to make a determination Mm -hmm. And that is whether you want from us recommendations for discipline. Okay. So we do an internal investigation. So we typically mm -hmm. have a form that goes up through our chain of command based on the matrix, what we recommend as punishment. So we were told in the, in the commission's training that that has been a jurisdiction to jurisdiction decision. Mm -hmm. Some jurisdictions say, we don't want to know what you think. We don't want anything from, we want to start with, right on the fence right. without any influence from the, the police departments. Others have said, absolutely, we want to know what, what you right. think as, as the chief or as the sheriff. So I guess you guys are going to have to determine. So that's our homework. we got to determine. Right. As a matter of policy, right. whether you want that from us. I did notice in, this, in the information that Mr. Burke's office forwarded from Calvert County that they do, apparently do make recommendations. So I'll tell you the one that we have that's pending ACC mm -hmm. review doesn't have a rec rec recommendation it's okay you know you can read into it what you want but it right. doesn't have a recommendation right. and ours does so okay all right we're, we're going to need to have that feedback okay so there is no there is no real guidelines to i guess to that point it's it's in the, it's up to the department sure. to determine it but then we the, won't release anything that's an active investigation okay. whether it's a traffic crash or uh, or a crime it, the difference is, is that when that footage is turned over to the attorney general's office, if we were to be involved in a pursuit where someone died, um, a use of force where someone died, or some sort of shooting where someone died. There was a shooting this weekend out in Frederick City. Um, IID came out and investigated that. And don't, don't, IID is, is, is the state police. Mm -hmm. That's who's investigating it, the state police is. The attorneys from the attorney general's office are guiding that investigation, but it's troopers 
that are doing everything with that investigation. The irony is that the troopers will do their own investigation when they shoot somebody. So that there's a caveat in there so that they investigate their own shootings. Um, that's how ass backwards the legislation is. But um, that's, the, that's the issue is what happens to that. We turn that over to IID. They have their own policies and procedures and laws on when that gets displayed to the public. You can go on the Attorney General's website, and I am pretty damn sure you can see just about every incident that they've investigated over the last year and a half in video. And then they actually, correct me if I'm wrong, they summarize each, each pane of what you're about to see. They summarize it as they go along. Mm -hmm. um, so the only time you're retired to turn, you're required to give that to them is when there's a death involved or Correct. Correct. potential death. Okay, all right, I got you. That, that's potential death. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because I was right. wondering what the yeah. Jobs Real quick, one another issue that the Frederick PAB is wrestling with, and the chief from uh, Mount Airy can test, is what information is supposed to be given to the ACC regarding past job performance, because you're required to oh. consider that. Okay. You're required to consider all the attaboys and all the right. oh, shits for like right. mitigating factors right. and aggravating all the bad factors. stuff. Mm -hmm. So ups. the question is how far back do you go? Right. How much do you want to know? Okay. Do you want summaries? You know And is that a I don't have an answer for you. I don't think right. Frederick has an answer for but has that been a jurisdiction by jurisdiction yeah. Yeah. determination? Yeah. Okay. And I would think standardization would probably be the, the key to all of this. Right, exactly. So like we have a recommendation for discipline process that includes a review of performance evaluations, right. their IA card, so here's what they've had in the past, mm -hmm. and then all of that kind of goes to... Into the pot. So then that would take us to the range within the matrix. Mm -hmm. And then the range in the matrix may be a reprimand up to three days loss of right. leave. Right. Um, so kind of like the complaint form, I think standardization is probably... And it's okay if you see it, he can't see it. Right. Because he's right. the, he's the permanent mm -hmm. chair of the hearing board, he can't be prejudiced by what he knows about that individual officer if right. they choose to take that to a trial board. Right. Yeah. Okay. There is mud, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so true. So true. Do you feel like you I'm good? Yeah. Got Whatever your else you guys update. have. Update. Does anybody else have any other updates? We have some homework that we're going to work on. Um, we've got our next date set, which is, did I bring my calendar with me? No, I did not bring my calendar with me. Is it June 4th, June 6th? Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. We've all agreed that we're on vacation that week. Oh, <laughs> man, can I come? <laughs> yeah, June 5th. All right, whatever that Monday is. Just confirm that. Yeah, so we're back here June 5th at 10 a.m. Um, if I, if we have, if the accountability board has follow-up questions with regard to working on some of this creation of some standardized stuff, we'll, we'll reach out to the agencies, but we'll be working with county attorney's office and it'll be an ongoing communication, I'm sure, ongoing conversation. Um, does anyone have anything else they want to add? So just in relation to how it worked between now and June 5th, yes. are, are we planning to have a sub-working session? I where think we're we'll have a work working session. Okay. Yeah, we'll figure that out amongst ourselves okay. as to when that's going to be when it works with everyone's schedule. Perfect. But yeah, I think that's the way to do it. Okay. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. All right. I'll second. Thank you. We are now adjourned. Thank you all so much. Thank you.